Hello, why are you all people looking at me again anyway? Hello, Salsita. Welcome to my humble art studio. Uh, today's episode, I will tell you what's stable diffusion in case you don't know. How does it work? What is, are some limitations it has? <clears throat> how to actually take control of it with many examples, some of them live. How we can maybe use it in Salsita for our own intents and purposes. And like I will compare it to Midjourney because, you know, it, for those of you who don't know, you will figure it out. I'll, I'll let you know. But it's like the kind of biggest, you know, thing in the market right now. So let's see how it compares. So in case you've spent the last kind of few months living under a rock, it's now possible to generate images from a text description. So I'll start by doing a demo. Uh, this is the UI. I will go not go too much into the into the details um, i will do it a bit as i you know as i do it so here's the thing that says prompt so you can write something here for example a movie poster of a chili pepper wizard and then you click generate and now you'll have to wait a bit take some time it's now gonna generate this beautiful thing and you will see how the process is going so looking good i would say so here we have it Danny Childilarl, yes, non osto all that. It's not great at text, as you might notice, but I would say that it you know, performed the task that I told it as, as expected. Cool. So how does it actually work? Dark magic. I don't know. Whatever. It, it works. Uh, I mean, it's actually a deep neural network. It has learned to denoise an image in multiple steps. So if you imagine you have this image of a cat, you can train a model to generate the picture of the you know actual cat without the noise from it. Uh, but you know, what if you train a noisier image like this? Like the good news is that it still works. Uh, there's two important ideas here. Like first, you train the network to estimate and remove some part of the noise on each step. It doesn't do it in one step. It can, does it in multiple of them, not all at once. So you know, in this example, if you would do it in two steps, it would remove some of the noise and then the next. And also, you're training it with a caption. You're telling it that this is a cat, you know, white and brown cat lying on a living room floor or something like that. So, I mean, what if, you know, you see what's coming, right? What if you use this image, right? Something that's like pure noise, like there is in utility, you know, make a cat out of it, right? Uh, I mean, and that's the key. Like, it can, it has learned how to denoise a cat out of pure noise. So the algorithm will be able to find the cat in the picture. Or, you know, if you tell it that it's something else, like, you know, a movie poster of a chili pepper wizard, it should be able to generate, or, you know, denoise the image into, into that, assuming that it's been trained on a data set that understands, you know, what is a chili pepper wizard, a movie poster, and a cat, and so on. And that's actually how it's trained, basically. You take the your image, you add noise to it, and you ask it to predict the, you know, denoised image from the noisy one. Cool. If you want more technical details, there's all these very important modules here. They, you know, they compute numbers, probably zeros and ones, I guess. I don't know. Follows algorithms. Machine learning. It's deep, and it has arrows as well. They connect things together. No, actually, I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't understand this in all, all the detail either. There's a couple more relevant points to, to, to make, and I'll leave you with the beautiful images. So, yeah, first of all, it takes the text that you write, and it converts it into basically an array of numbers that is somehow pointing to the concept that you are you, you described in this kind of yeah, multi-dimensional multi space. And you know, it uses this array of numbers to guide the, the noising process towards the image that you, you know, that's going to generate. But it, it doesn't work actually in the in the pixel space. It works like it doesn't work. If you ask it for a 512, 512 picture, it doesn't go pixel by pixel denoising it. It works in a like much smaller you know, representation, which is called latent space, and then you know, kind of decodes it as the last step into the into the pixel space. And that is what allows it to run into something like this machine, for example. So in case it was not clear, this example it's it's not connecting to any server. It's it's actually running on this on this laptop, which is kind of cool. Anyway, as I said, you know, dark magic. And the technical part is over, he said to the relief of most of the audience. Uh, let's have a quick break and solve one of Celsita's biggest mysteries. You want to know who is Lord Hoven?
So a wanted poster for Lord Hoban, the filer of toilets. Let's see what comes up with. And I will prepare one more for Lady Hoban because I'm not sexist, right? We don't know if it's a man or not. Uh, so this is Lord Hoban. His name is Danny Dwight. And that, that's him. Let's see Lady Hoban. Uh, I hope it doesn't look like anyone in the company, actually. <laughs> to be pretty awkward. It doesn't, I would say. Yeah. That's it's Lady Bennett, whatever. Yeah, as you could see, again, the text was not great either, but now we know who is Lord Hoban. We can go on. So what is actually stable diffusion? So this algorithm that I explained is called latent diffusion. Stable diffusion is actually a set of a family of models that was trained by this company called Stability AI. They train them with like a bazillion images, but it's kind of become the name for the whole thing because like a kind of all the models that are derived from it, you can train your models on top of that, specialize things on it, like train concepts, train styles and so on. And they all use the stable diffusion ones as a base, as far as I know. Because it's you know it's pretty comprehensive, it understands a lot of things and it's very generic. So yeah, people have trained models that perform better in some specific task, like you know, some uh, you know photorealistic portraits or cartoon style, or some people do you know images of people who have very little clothing or none, and their anatomies are not exactly realistic. Because you know, don't ask me, but. If you give the people the ability to generate any image, some people will use it for porn. Anyway, it also runs on your machine. Uh, if you have the hardware, which is usually you know, dedicated graphics card, at least four gigabytes of video RAM, ideally NVIDIA. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, weaknesses, I mean, rendering text is not its strength. There are models who are you know, actually better at it, but like the basic, you know, stable diffusion ones don't do that all, all too well. Also, if you try something, some prompt that's too complex, it's going to mix up things together. It doesn't know, you know, what goes with what. And you don't have much control over, you know, the image composition as it is. It will just generate it, whatever it, you know, it wants. So let's try with some, you know, more complex prompt. A man with blonde hair next to a woman with black hair. I'm not going to run it because that's boring. I wanted statistical significant data, so I did six of them. And if you count, three of them did what I wanted. And three of them, the man is blonde and the woman is, you know, has black hair. And the others, there are two women or one man with the you know, wrong hair color. So it has issues correctly associating where the blondness goes and the you know, man and woman. Also, you know, notice the bias. They are all kind of young, white, beautiful, or traditionally beautiful people, because that's what the model has seen the most of. So, you know, if you don't tell it otherwise, it's what's you know, most likely to produce. <clears throat> but, you know, let's try making it a bit more complex. Now we will make them hold hands as well. So, two out of six on hair color, like the top left and the bottom right. Three out of six have visible hand holding. But if you pay a bit kind of closer attention, the hands are maybe not all that great. There's something very, very, very wrong, right, with this. Like, it's, who's, okay. And what is this other hand as well? Like the bottom one, I, who's, why? Is there a third person? Or like the fingers, who, whose are those fingers? This nail is like, oh my God, this is horrible, right? And yeah, so let's see what we can do to take control of the chaos. And the basic thing you can do is just generate it again, and it might work, but that's kind of not very interesting. And sometimes it will just you know, take too many generations to get something. So first of all, the basics is just write a better prompt, right? And what that means is you know figure out what the model was trained on, how the captions were you know look like, what sort of keywords work for this model, and you know learn about art styles, photography techniques, concepts, anything, anything you want, and you try it on the AI, and it will generally provide you a better result. You know, generally being more descriptive helps, unless you you know overdo it. But you know, prompt engineering will only take you so far. Like you need to understand that this is this is not ChatGPT. This is not a large language model. It was trained on images and like short one sentence or two sentence captions. So there's like a lot of nuance that it just lost to, 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 the, to the model. So we can do more things to, to control it. So 
you can give it something that's called a negative prompt, which means the generation will stay you know, away from what you prompted. So let's find, yeah. Let's generate now a handsome, mature, bald, bearded man singing karaoke in a colorful underground club. It's not inspired on any person that we, any of us know. I don't know why you're laughing. And you know, maybe I don't like that it's too, it's too pink, right? And too, too blue. So I will generate it again. I change the, the you know, resolution, like the, the width and height, I swapped it. Uh, see it now. I put it. I wrote pink and blue onto the negative prompt. It's not pink. It's not blue. It looks awesome, actually. It looks too good. Uh, but you know, maybe I want it to be more colorful now. And of course, if we want it to be closer to reality, it needs to be like much more handsome. So by adding these numbers, you tell it, okay, this is called attention or emphasis. Basically, you tell it, okay, pay more attention to the colorful, like. Like add, add more, more emphasis to it. Like when you're generating the image, this is more important than the rest the other words. The others, you know, by default have attention of, of one. Or you can make it also negative or like reduce it like lower than one. So I don't want it to be too that old because you know uh, it's much much closer to reality. And so now it's gonna be handsomer, younger, and with a more colorful club, ideally. And Okay, at least it doesn't show the well, whatever. Could be worse. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly what, what you can do to control the... It's, uh, it's, you know, don't, don't ask questions. And, and besides that, yeah, let's go on. Then you can do other things like, you know, remember the cats where, you know, we were going from one cat to a noisier and a noisier cat. And then we decided, oh, well, let's start from the noise and then we will denoise anything from there. So instead of starting the process with completely random noise, we could start with an image and add a bit of noise to it because otherwise there's nothing to the noise. And you will see, I'll, I'll take this image, I like it a lot. And I'll send it this, you know, image to image. And now here you can tell it basically. Uh, you know how much do you want to do you want it denoised? So if you have like a relatively small number, it will start with something that's pretty pretty close to it, and it will not change the image all that much. I will change something else here to make it faster. Don't mind me. And it basically regenerated the same image with changing some details. There's different people in the background, the face, like the thing in the hand is slightly different. But you know, you could you could make it like a lot higher the noising strength, and it will generate it again. And it will basically you will see the noise happening. It starts from something much more different. It will still, I mean, it's still the same exact prompt, so it will generate a similar image anyway. But it will follow the same pattern. One more thing that I like this one more. One more thing you can do is something called in painting, which means whoop, I'm gonna go here, and I don't like that the hand has six fingers. I'm not, I'm not sure what how you feel about this, and the other is kind of wrong as well. So I will, but I like the rest of the image. It's cool. I like the yellow microphone actually, and I'll tell it, you know, like not don't denoise it so much, and generate it. So basically, it will take the hand, well, it'll take this whole space here, and it will re. It will keep the rest of the image in its own state, and it will generate something else. Now it has four fingers. Oh, it has, I guess the thumb is not there, so it counts, right? Good job. Uh, another thing you can do with painting, like what I did, is basically take the. It took the original image as a as a starting point, and it added some noise, and then it denoised it. But I could tell it that instead of that, I want to add noise to it. Instead of starting with the hand, it would start with noise. Or in, I'm not going to do the hand because that's boring. I'm going to do something here in the head. Uh, I'm not sure with that man with horns. No, oh, I didn't write that. I hope this works. Uh, if not, oh well. And uh, now it will basically, instead of starting with something, <laughs> Uh, well, it did one horn. 
It's better than none. Um, it's like a unicorn thing more than a demon as I was going for, but it 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 it, it did it right. There is also a concept that's called outpainting. I don't have an example here, but basically you could tell it to extend the image, like make it you know 100 pixels wider to the right, and it would try to generate something that you know that would match the like that, that would match the, the image and the description or basically the prompt and still follow the, the logic of the image. Uh, besides that, there's something pretty cool that you can do. It's called regional prompts. And that helps a lot controlling the image composition. Uh, I'm going to have it here. So let's go back to our example with a man and a woman and the hair. Um, so there's a lot of options that I'm not going to cover because it would take three years. And you tell it you want this. And now it's telling, okay, some part of the prompt will go to the left, so some part can go to the right. You can even do it, you know, vertical, or you can even do masks or something like that. Or, or something like that. Let's make it horizontal because it makes more sense. Also, I'm going to use a common prompt, which means the first part of the prompt will be applied to the whole image. The second part will be applied to the left, and the third part will go to the right. So, it's going to be a man next to a woman, but on the first part, it will pay attention to the left one. And then, like, the attention will be like a man with a blonde hair, and a woman with a black hair will be like all, always done on the right side. And it looks pretty good. And actually, like for statistical purposes, I created six of them. It's not cherry picked. So, five out of six did exactly what I said. One of them, well, there is the man with the blonde hair and the woman with the black hair. There's a woman in the middle. I don't know, everyone is free to do whatever they want. And then now, last but not least, way to, to take control of this whole thing. I, I did save the, the best for last, so hold on tight to your, your meals. This is something called control net. <clears throat> so you can give it an image to start from, but it, it's very different from image to image. It will not just add image to the no <clears throat> you know, noise to the image and then denoise it, but it will extract some features from the image. And it will use those features to guide the image generation. And features like this could be like the pose, or the edges of the image, or the normal map, depth map, or even the style. And I know that this sounds super abstract. So let's see an example or, or six. Uh, let's go back to our, our man uh, singing karaoke. And I don't know, I didn't like the pose. I think I would like to have another pose that's like kind of cooler. So doo -doo -doo, I'm going to enable a few things. And I'm going to take another image that I prepared for this. I like this pose a lot more. And basically, I'm going to tell it there's a lot of these things. So I'm going to use open pose and interpret it with an open pose model. And that's what I'm going to eat. And what it's going to do, it's going to deduce the pose from this image. It's going to generate an open post thing. You will see it soon. And it will generate an image. And you use the open post, you know, like example that they generated or like a post that they generated to guide the, the generation of the, of the other image. So, and one other thing you can do, you can, you can just directly, if you want, you can create your own post. It's going to look something like this. And you can make it whatever you want. Um, and see, it, it, it did what I I wanted. That, that's the post it, it deduced from, from Mick Jagger, and then that's how it looks. It doesn't have a microphone, uh, but, you know, whatever. It's still not pink nor blue, by the way. Uh, I will remove this, just give it a bit more freedom. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what else you can do? I'm not going to run, like, all the million examples, but I'm going to show you. No, I took this image. I put it through a control net that's called Edge or Line Art, I think. Yeah, Line Art. And it, from this, it generated this. That's it, it deduced the, the edges of the image and it generated this. And I told it, I mean, this is like a work meeting, right? So it's a work meeting. Uh, it did its best, right? Interestingly, the letters are quite close to it. So basically, how this works is. It took the input, it trans transformed it into this line art, and it took the prompt as well, a work meeting, and 
you know, it, it, the the generation never actually saw the, the original image. It just saw the the line art like parsed thing, and it guided the generation using this. Let's do more examples because this is cool. Uh, so I can take the same image. I made it calculate uh, UV map, like a uh, yeah, phase map. How's it called? Normal map. Sorry. So I made it calculate the normal map, which means basically it, it interpreted the image as if it, it was a 3D an image of a 3D world, and it deduced which sizes, which sides each phase of the image would you know be facing on the 3D, and then you tell it you know it's a work meeting again, and like basically it, it still follows the the depth of the of the image like it, it's really great to you know if you have a specific image composition in mind like it's gonna do that like that's exactly the same the same process let's do it again so what if i told it to calculate a depth map that means like you know what is in the front of the image and what is on the back um again it's a work meeting that looks exactly like all the meetings i've been on well some of them more than others uh and you know, basically, it, it took it all from the from the depth. Uh, again, it's the same process. And like what you can also do, like you know, another example, you take this and you make it calculate very precisely all the edges. And here I gave it a bit more freedom. It's not a work meeting. I told it it's peppers or something like that. And I I let the the control net be more more free basically, so that it would <clears throat> it wouldn't generate just like the exact same thing otherwise. So yeah, we have a new Salsita, very peppery, peppery logo. One last cool thing you can do, or one that I will talk about, you can do a lot more. With this control net, this take a style. This is a picture, like an image that Lara created. It's like a carnivorous plant, very cool style. So I told it just, you know, take this, learn somehow the style from it directly like it, it happens you know live basically the same as I, I did it's not doing any actual training so extract the style and generate me a pepper from it and i mean yeah like i think it's it, it's it's pretty similar to the to the style i would say if you actually wanted to you know make it really close to the style and generate a lot of images that you know really match this style it would be possible to actually you know train it you would take a few dozen images tag them put them to through some training process and then it would learn you know lara style or lara carnivorous plant style whatever you call it and you know one more example because you know we need to do a work meeting so it you know kind of more or less works right um the other cool thing one of many is you can combine these things, right? So you can apply more than one control net at the same time. I took the depth one, and then like I took the, the canny one for the edges, and basically it generated an image with the same composition. I told it it's a work meeting again because we're obsessed with that. Uh, I have too many meetings, and and basically, you know, it, it generated the edges from the bottom one, it took the depth from the top one, and indeed it combined them into this thing, right? So you can now put text and logos into images. I mean, it's a bit forced, but, you know, it was the first time I tried, or I tried 10 times, this was the best. But, you know, I, I don't have all the, you know, parameters and everything kind of set up. I, I would need to work more on that. So how do we use it in Salsita? So first of all, license. Basically, you can do anything as long as you don't use it for crime and like all these horrible things. Uh, and you own all your images. You can use them commercially. You can sell them. You can print them and put a poster in your bedroom, whatever you want. That's for the base models, like the stable diffusion ones that Stability AI created. There's a lot of models based on that that people have trained. Most of them don't maybe even specify any license, so it's kind of, you know, whatever. Some of them change this. Some of them have been trained with some proprietary images, and they say, you know, you cannot use them commercially, blah, blah, blah. But I think, like I would say, most of them, it's fine. Also, it's very hard to know which model created anything, so it's pretty, you know, unenforceable. So use cases. I don't know. Why are you looking at me? Okay, I have some ideas. Like we could maybe create stock images, for example, for the blog. Why not? Like 
whatever. Uh, I also tried generating some UI layouts. And I was actually using this regional prompter here. I wanted to get some navigation menu on the top and a chat on the right, and it didn't work all that well. But you know, if you want, I, I don't know. If, if, I don't think this is super useful, but you can do it. It has some idea about web design, but it's not its strength. I think it's possible to train it to do better, but I'm not sure how much effort it would actually take to get to something usable. I, I will take you know. I'll think about it. You can also, you know, do logos or icons, for example. Like it doesn't do vectors, at least out of the box, but it's able to get the style close enough. Like there are, uh, you know, there are tools that convert raster images to vector, which, which you know, decent enough automation and accuracy. So theoretically, we could use that. I also tried it for chatbots because we we're talking about having a chatbot icon. So here it is. Here's what I it came up with. I was trying it. I, both for the chatbot icon or a chatbot icon for a or avatar or something for a for a kitchen configurator, and I don't know. I think they they're pretty cool. I'm pretty fond of the of the middle bottom one because like it manages to look like a bot, but also a speech bubble, which is ah chat, but also a cooking pan, and it it has like the the apron, so it's also a cook. So I, I would totally use it. Uh, and there's some some bloppers are a bit more coarse. Uh, we can also use it to train Matt's face and generate it in all sorts of hilarious situations. But I, I don't have his permission to do that, so don't worry. I, I didn't do it. Uh, but I, I, I as, as you might have noticed, I, I did train myself. Uh, so in theory, yeah, you, you could train concepts, people, you can train a lot of things. And yeah, so why is Table Diffusion and not not Midjourney, so I mean, there's a lot of you know of online services. There's Dali, Adobe Firefly, Midjourney. Bing is able to generate images now too, uh, but it seems to me that Midjourney is the best at this point out of out of those. So let's compare. So first of all, Midjourney looks awesome. Like you write something and it will generate an image that it's it's pretty it's really good. I mean, it requires very little effort to create something, and you know, <clears throat> you don't have to have the hardware. You just connect to the to the app and you, you write and you don't, you don't like it, you click again and you generate something else. And it's pretty cheap. I mean, it's $10 per month or 60 if you want the images to be private. Otherwise, they're kind of public. And the interface is gone through with some Discord, which is this chat application, which is not super user friendly and it's a bit limiting. And it can it can be used commercially, but Midjourney will store all the images and can use any prompts and images you create for their own purposes, which is kind of you know, slightly weird. Also, there's the issue of censorship or you know like limitations. I will talk about it a bit more later. On the other hand, Stable Diffusion it's free, free because you need to run it somewhere, so you need decent enough hardware and pay for it, for the electricity. Or you know, paying some online service to host it. And the UI is more advanced. You can you know customize basically anything. Like I didn't show you even one percent of the things that you can touch and settings and sliders and options that it that it has. You can there's hundreds of extensions. You can even write your own if you want. Uh, you can use the models from other people, or you can train your own models. Like you know, there's a million things. Uh, but it does take a lot more effort, I would say, to reach. You know, the higher quality, like, you know, mid-journey or similar does. So, kind of my summary, like, to me, mid-journey is like a bit of the Mac and Stable Diffusion is Linux. But, you know, mid-journey works great out of the box, but you're kind of stuck in the box. Well, you know, with Stable Diffusion, you have to put together the box yourself a bit because some parts are kind of fall apart if you don't. And if you want it to be pretty, but you have a lot of tools to to do that and to customize it. And back on the on the censorship, like Midjourney controls, you know, whatever it, you send something to their API, they can tell you, "Hey, we're not going to generate that. Um, you're banned." So you tell it, you know, the word "pleasure" is banned, for example, because you don't want to create big people who are experiencing any sort of pleasure, right? It's wrong. And I mean, so it is understandable. Like, there's a lot of, you know, gore, adult things that you probably don't want, I guess. I mean, but, you know, from some, I checked some lists on the internet and like words like toilet 
organs, knob, sensual are censored. So it's like, okay, and, and you have no guarantees. Like if you want, you know, Xi Jinping or however the Chinese president is there, you cannot generate him either. Uh, so yeah, there, there's no, no guarantees of what they will, you know, allow or disallow tomorrow because they own the whole process. I also saw that they banned the beach emoji. I'm not sure if it's real or if it's a joke. I haven't tried it. I, I don't have the access, but so I cannot confirm. So take it as a as a rumor. And so yeah, we're reaching the end. That was quick. A uh, few resources. That's the repository I use for the UI. There's some installer uh, somewhere else as well. Otherwise, if you clone the repository and just start pulling it, if you're not good at Git, then you know I can help you at some point. Some tutorials that you know, both basic and, and more complicated. And I will use these two models basically for all the examples that I've done. Though, but there's like hundreds of them uh, available for like multiple different things. Not all of them pornographic. Uh, I would say no, m most of them are actually generic enough to be able to do that. But you, with some of them, you have to be careful if you don't tell it the you know, to not generate uh, new people, it might happen. Um, sorry. Actually, I, I'm going to tell you a secret. I was generating this, these things. I, I have this thing called save, which was applying a negative prompt, kind of hidden here. Uh, it's kind of visible here. So, like, you know, not safe for work, new, naked was kind of always in the negative prompt, just in case, because I didn't want to generate karaoke singers with less clothes than I would have been comfortable with. Uh, I, I think no, this this model is, is pretty generic and I, I don't think it would have generated anything too explicit, right? But, you know, I didn't want to take the risk. And that's it for now. Does anyone have any questions?